This is the first of four PowerPoint presentations on supply and demand, the market system. This first presentation talks about the demand side of the market, the construction of a demand curve, and the forces that shift the demand for a product or service. The second presentation will take the same approach for the supply curve and the buyer, the, pardon me, the seller side of the market, the producer side. The third presentation will put the first two together and talk about equilibrium in a market, how buyers and sellers interact, and how they at least attempt to reach an equilibrium in the market. And it will discuss what disequilibrium means when the price is not contributing towards a, uh, an equilibrium. The fourth presentation in the long one is the one you'll probably spend most of your time with. It's got some sample problems to demonstrate what happens in a market when you have forces affecting both the supply and the demand for a product. Those sample problems are probably the best start you can get on the homework, which is again the best pr preparation you can get to prepare for the first exam, particularly in microeconomics. Just as a quick overview, these next few slides are going to talk about how supply and demand, very active forces in our economy, guide our production and our choices as consumers. There are going to be five forces that affect or shift the demand curve. You're going to want to know those forces very, very well. There are also five forces we will identify that will move or shift the supply curve. You're, again, you're going to want to be able to recognize any of those forces at work when you read about them or observe them in the real world. Next, we're going to talk about equilibrium. When you put the supply curve and the demand curve on the same graph, the point at which they intersect is the point of equilibrium. At the price indicated there, the quantity demanded will exactly equal the quantity supplied. The market is said to be in equilibrium. And then finally, we'll talk about what happens when the price does not reach equilibrium, when it is either above or below, when it either creates a surplus or a shortage. All right, let's take a look at what a demand curve looks like, what it's trying to tell us. On the vertical axis, we're going to show the price for the product in question. Where in this case, we're going to say, what if the price is $9? What if the price is $6? What if the price is $4? And then we're going to look along the horizontal axis, which measures the quantity that people buy. And we're going to say, how much do they buy at each price? At $9, for example, let's say they're buying 13 units every day. Connecting these two points, or finding these two points in space, that first black dot up there represents behavior. It's how many units are purchased at the price of $9. Going further, if at $6 we see that people purchase 21 units per day, we plot that point and we see $6, 21 units. Second point out there in our two-dimensional space. Finally, at $4 we observe purchases increase to $28 a third point in our two-dimensional space. Now what we've done is show how behavior changes when prices change. In this case, as prices fall, the quantity purchased, also known as the quantity demanded, increases. By plotting these points and connecting them together, we get a reflection of human behavior, how people are changing their behavior based on different prices. This is our demand curve. The demand curve has a negative slope, 
That's common sense. As the price gets lower, people buy more. As the price rises, people buy less. Remember, we typically read this by reading, if the price is such and such, then the quantity demanded is such and such. So price is the independent variable. It changes first, and then we look and see how much people are buying. All right, let's go back to this original demand curve, D1, with our original points plotted on it, and ask what would happen if, for some reason, this product became more popular, more necessary. People just wanted more of it. For example, if at the price of $9, what if people now began to purchase 23 units? Not 13, but 23 now. Gives us a new point out there in space. What if the price at $6 generated sales of 31 units, a new point out there in space. And finally, what if the price dropped to $4 and now purchases increased all the way to 39 units? You can see we've got three new dots, new points out there in space. We're going to connect them all. And we're going to call this demand curve number two. The entire demand curve has shifted. In this case, it's shifted to the right. Listen carefully. This means the quantity demanded at every price has increased. I say again, the quantity demanded at every price has increased. This results in a shift of the demand curve to the right, an increase, and this is what we refer to when we say there has been an increase in demand. A change in demand means the entire demand curve shifts, in this case to the right, it could shift back to the left. We'll see examples of that as we go along. Now we're going to talk about the shifts in the demand curve. We'll just show those graphically. We're going to talk about the forces that will cause that demand curve to shift. This is probably one of the two or three most important slides you're going to see for this entire discussion over supply and demand. The material we're going to use now takes a little more mental effort. You've got to memorize it. You've got to be able to use it, recognize it when you're seeing what's going on in the world. So this list of forces is critical to your success, so pay attention. First, let's talk about the things that cause the demand curve to increase. Increase is always a shift of the curve to the right. Notice we say when demand increases. We could say when the demand curve increases. If it helps you remember that, go with it, okay? Five forces that will increase the demand for a product. Force number one, if there are more buyers for the product. For example, what happens in Gainesville, Florida, when more people come into town for one of those Florida Gator home football games? Well, the bars are packed. Yeah, there's a whole lot more people out there. They're buying a whole lot more stuff. The demand for just about everything increases. Second force, buyer's expectations. Now, this one frequently takes a little bit of case-by-case uh, -case analysis. Uh, if people expect, for example, the Gators are going to have a great year, they're going to go out and buy lots and lots of Gator memorabilia, caps, t-shirts, whatever. Okay, But if the team's not doing too well, their expectations may cause them demand, to demand less Gator paraphernalia. Um, another example might be stocks. If people expect, expect a stock price to rise, they tend to run out and buy it. If they expect it to fall, they tend to back away from it. They don't demand as much of it. And the third one's pretty easy, too. When something becomes more popular, when tastes or preferences or popularity for something increases, then the demand for that product shifts to the right. The next two forces are a little more complicated. Go with me slowly here, OK? The fourth force that is going to affect the demand curve, going to shift the demand curve, in this case, to the right. This is going to be the price of a related good. Now, there's two kinds here. You've got to keep them straight. First, there's the price of a substitute. Think of this, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. We're going to talk about Coca-Cola. We're looking at the Coca-Cola market, and we see that the price of a substitute increases the price of Pepsi. If the price of Pepsi goes up, what's going to happen to the demand for Coca-Cola? Well, we're going to buy more Coca-Cola because it is relatively cheaper. Is that making sense? When the price of Pepsi goes up, there's an increase in the demand for Coca-Cola. 
So when the price of a substitute goes up, the demand for the product you're looking at increases. The uh, other alternative there is what we call complements. These are goods, not, a, not that are substitutes for one another, but that are used together. They're purchased together, they're consumed together. Peanut butter and jelly, okay? Think about this. If the price of peanut butter falls, what's going to happen to the demand for jelly? If peanut butter is cheaper, we can buy more of that, and we want more jelly to go with it, assuming you like peanut butter and jelly. So if the price of a complement decreases, then you get an increase in the demand for the good you're talking about. If you're thinking beer and pizza, maybe, okay? If beer gets cheaper, will they sell more pizza? Sure. People are going to buy more beer. They're going to want more pizza to go with it. Maybe not everybody, but remember, this isn't just about a single individual. This is about the market overall. And some of you may say, well, I don't like beer anyway, so I'm not going to buy any more pizza. Well, Hang on just a second. This is not about you. This is about the market. Okay, keep that in mind. We're always talking about the market. Let's go to the fifth force that will affect the demand curve, incomes. When people have more money. Uh, we got two different cases here. The usual one, the normal one is this. When incomes go up, demand increases. That's true for most goods, the vast majority. If you're running a grocery store and you see that people are earning more money, what can you expect? You're going to sell more steak. You're going to sell more wine. You're going to sell more seafood. Most of the time when people get more money, they, get a, they, they create a greater demand for the products they normally buy. But there is an exception. There are some goods that as people get more money, they buy less of them. Best example, Spam, the meat product. If you've never tried it, check it out sometime. It's not the most tasty meat source out there. Better example, how about ramen noodles? If you get more money, if your income goes up, do you want to go out and buy more ramen noodles? I don't think so. In fact, for these goods, if your income goes, up, goes down, that's when you might want to buy more of them. If you have a decrease in income, then your demand for ramen noodles is going to increase because that's what you can afford now. Come on to class and we'll talk about some interesting recipes using ramen noodles and Spam and hot sauce and other neat delicacies. Okay, these five forces, got to recognize them when you're reading in the newspaper, listening to the news, are going to cause an increase in the demand for a product. Maybe the product's oil, maybe the product's copper. But you want to watch for these and be able to recognize them in the real world. Let's look down the other side now. What will cause a decrease in, de in demand, which is a shift to the left of the demand curve? Here we go, just the opposite. Instead of more buyers, fewer buyers. People go out of town for the summer. Suddenly business falls off for a lot of the restaurants. Sometimes buyers' expectations will make them decrease their demand for something. If, for example, they read that uh, pizza makes you too fat or pizza is bad for your health, what's going to happen? They're going to buy less pizza. Many times they just lose their preferences or tastes for a particular product, or it loses its popularity. Now we can turn around this price of a related good exactly the opposite. Look at it. If the price, is a, price of a substitute decreases, people buy that instead of the good that is in question. If, if Pepsi gets cheaper, the demand for Coca-Cola is going to decrease. Think through the logic of that. Likewise, if the price of a complement increases, uh, we can't afford peanut butter. We don't need to buy the jelly to go with it. We have a decrease there. Finally, on incomes, turn it around. If incomes incre decrease, we're going to see a decrease in the demand for most everything. Not quite everything, but most goods. Likewise, if incomes increase, people are going to buy less. They're going to decrease their demand for things like spam and ramen noodles and other inferior goods. This list is critical to you. Revisit it write it up into some sort of a memorization sheet that'll, that'll help you. You're going to need it again and again and again throughout the rest of this course. Okay, let's go back and review a little bit on this change in demand versus change in quantity demanded. Okay, we'll start out with a regular demand curve, the negative slope, with the relationship between the price and the quantity purchased. We'll call it demand curve number one, and we'll ask, what could cause this demand curve to increase or shift to the right? 
become D2? And the answer is more buyers, a change in expectations, maybe something is expected to increase in value or improve your health or help you be less ugly, I don't know. Um, an increase in preferences and popularity. Also an increase in incomes for normal goods and an increase in the price of a substitute or a decrease in the price of a complement. You've got to know all of those five forces that could increase demand. Keep that straight in your mind. Then what could cause a demand curve to decrease? <clears throat> Answer, just the opposite. Fewer buyers, less popular product. Buyers are afraid it's going to lose value or it's going to hurt your health. Uh, you could have a decrease in income for a normal good. You could have an increase in income for an inferior good. Okay. Then you could have what? A decrease in the price of a substitute or an increase in the price of a complement. I know I'm going through those fast, but I want you to go back to the previous slide and make sure you're real clear on the forces that can move the demand curve. Once again, remember, a shift to the right is an increase, a shift to the left is a decrease. These are changes in demand. The whole demand curve, the entire curve, shifts to the right or to the left. Change in demand. Contrast that with this. If you start out at a point on demand curve number one, point A, subsequently you find yourself at a different point on the demand curve, point B. Are you buying more of the product? Yes, you are. Read down on the quantity axis, you'll see from point A to point B, people are buying more, but is that an increase in demand? No. The demand curve did not move. What this is, is an increase in the quantity demanded. What caused that to happen? Well, the price fell. The price got lower. Remember, when we move along the demand curve as a result of the change in price, we have a change in the quantity demanded. Let's reemphasize that. When the price changes, the curve doesn't shift. Price doesn't shift the curve. Price was not on the, either of those lists we just looked at on the last slide. When the price changes, you move along the curve, and the result is a change in the quantity demanded, not a change in demand. By contrast, if you started from point A and wound up at point C, hey, you're on a new demand curve. One of those five forces must have changed, and now you've shifted or increased demand. If you need to look at these slides multiple times to get this straight, do so. If you need to come by and talk to me, make an appointment and do so. If you want to email me with your questions, do so. But make sure this stuff is straight in your mind. All right?